about the different regions. Just getting familiar with the different regions. Talked about the Human Development Index and GDP as different measure, measures of seeing how developed the country is. Of course, it's very important for marketing. Okay? People's incomes are changing, they're moving to cities, they're expecting a better life, they're investing money. Countries, you can't just think about business to customer or business to business. Business to government is also large business. Right? Do you know business to government? So if the governments are spending a lot of money on health and education and infrastructure, then there's also a lot of business opportunities there. So it means there's new demand for everything from soap, you understand soap, to cars. So are you a member of the 10,000 Club? Not yet? So if you earn more than $10,000 a year, you're in the 10,000 Club. So after we get to this club, we can, we said that we can uh, buy most of the things that the other people in this club can buy. So discuss with your partner, do you want to sell men's face cream? What country are you going to sell it in? You're a cream company that makes men's face cream. You're going to go abroad. What country are you going to go to? Japan. I think Europe is not a good one because the chemical is more Asian. The combination of the chemicals maybe does not. I have different things in European or American things. So, okay. So, are you going to sell it in a country first of all that's in the ten thousand club or not in the ten thousand club? In the ten thousand, people who are not earning ten thousand dollars a year are the men going to be buying much face cream? No, no. Alright, that's the kind of product they will buy after they have a certain level of income. Okay? Then after that, we, we, what, are, what else will we think about? What other things should we think about? First we thought about the basic income. They have over $10,000 a year income. Country. What else are we going to think about? People's self-conscious. Yes, men's fashion, right? Which countries? Culturally, they are more. The men are more concerned about their appearance. France, France Korea, Italy. Italy. Any other countries? <coughs> Fine. Okay. So one of those countries. Then we we can think about a lot more factors, right? About the competition and so on. <coughs> Just we want to make the point that if we're selling men's face cream, we're not going to go to a country which is not has lower income, okay? Because it's kind of like luxury, a little bit like mm -hmm. luxury. luxury product, not the daily product that you need for living. Uh, so <coughs> regions also depend on the geographic and temporal factors and cultural factors. So, for example, differences across time zones are more important than physical distance. So Korea and Australia has the same time zone, right? More or less. Then they're quite far away. But because they're on the same time zone, or in China, China also similar time zone, okay? then they can trade more easily. Uh, trade tends to travel more easily in north-south directions than it did in ancient times, so that's like the same time zone, right? <coughs> so, if we are very far away, 
it's hard to make a good economic relationship. Very, very far away. So we, uh, we talked before about cultural factor like the British Empire. So the, what countries were in the British Empire before? India. 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 Australia. Australia. Um, Malaysia. Malaysia. Singapore. Singapore. They had a saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire when it was the 19th century because they had South Africa. So this, it was always, the sun was always up. Okay, so those countries have a little bit similar culture. So the more similar the culture, the more likely the market is to succeed because you understand the outlook and viewpoints of their colleagues. So which country is more similar to you? Italy, France, Japan. Japan. Those countries. Japan. Japan may have more similar culture. So you might have more success, especially if it's your first time to go abroad, to go to Japan. Okay, also it's closer and so on. Okay, so we have these kind of groups then in, uh, based on those things. We have regional cooperation groups and free trade areas. So what is a free trade area? Can anybody tell me? No tariffs. Okay, what free trade areas do you know? What about in Africa? Do you know any retail areas there? Hmm? <coughs> so, uh, Customs Union is the next step. So, Europe went through these steps. Customs Union. First, Europe made the free trade area in the 60s, then it made customs union in the 70s. So customs union means that we all have the same tariff on the outside. So it's not that big change from free trade area, okay? Just it means that in the free trade area, there could be a way that Korea has a free trade agreement with the US and Europe, okay? But maybe Korea has a low tariff on some good. So I could, if I'm in Europe, I could buy the Korean good and then try to sell it in the US. But if we have the customs union, we can't do that because we have the same tariff on the outside product. Okay? So Korea has a low tariff, Europe has a high tariff, right? So I have free trade with Korea, so I buy the products from Korea. So I get them without the high tariff from Europe. So it's a natural progression. After we have the free trade area, next we make customs union. Then we have the common market. So Europe is a common market now, which is a big step. Okay. The main point of the common market is free flow of labor. So anybody can work in the other countries. Would you like to make a common market with, you have an FTA with Europe and the US. Would you like to make a common market in the future with Europe and the US? Or not? What do you think? Free movement of labor. It means anybody can work. In Europe, 20 or 30 years ago, I couldn't go to Italy to work. Now I can go to Italy and work, no problem. Just show up, and they just give me a social security number, because I have an Irish passport. Okay? Do you want to make that kind of agreement with the US and Europe? Hmm? Maybe? Okay, so in the future we might see this. At the moment, the EU and the US are negotiating a free trade agreement. So, you know, they have to go through the different steps, right? First, the free trade agreement, then the customs union, then the common market. It may take years. Okay, in Europe, everything is happening, you know, 20 years later. It takes time. Finally, the political union. Europe is not really a political union. 
Yes. Okay. So the problem is people in Europe don't really want to make a political union yet. So Europe has its own parliament. Do you understand parliament? Mm. Yeah. But the parliament has no power practically. <coughs> okay. Uh, they also have the president, the president of the EU, but practically they don't have much power. Just they, they can suggest things to the country. The European Commission works like the, the ministry, ministries, they prepare all the report, and then the parliament approves the report of the commission. And, but the, usually the commission is just suggesting uh, to the countries to do this or do that. But, Countries still make up their own mind, and in fact, this year the UK is having a is having a referendum on whether to stay in the EU or leave the EU. So the UK wants the opposite; they want less political, they want less power for Europe, and more power for the UK at the moment. But if we have a political union, we can think of China. China used to be different states, right? Or India or Russia, or the US, okay? Many of them have a federal arrangement, like the US, federal, or Germany is also federal, okay? Federal means we have all the different states with their own laws, okay? In the US, they have different law for each state, so the US is a federation. They're not different countries, they're different states. But they have the same president and government, so they have a political union. So, we talked about the BRICS before, so they're important in the future. We can see this estimate from the US Department of Commerce. 75% of the growth in world trade will come from these 130 developing and newly industrialized economies. Okay. So the big, the main, like there is some dominating, five big ones which dominate, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and uh, South Africa, there shouldn't be a K there. Uh, Turkey would be close, and Mexico, not included there, but Turkey and Mexico would be like the next big two. So they all, they're all very large. They all have large populations. Okay, so they're all big markets for a wide, wide range of products. So if you're selling face cream, you have a market of 1.5 billion people in China. Do you know the populations of those countries? Hmm? More, than, more than a billion. Do you know the populations of all the different countries? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the BRICS, if we look at it, the population by country, we'll see that the BRICS are dominating in population. Okay, so China, 1.32 billion. Okay, India, 1.326. India will pass China in population because they have a higher birth rate. Okay urban population, but China's population is mainly living in urban areas, so it's easier for marketing. China, a lot of people living in rural areas, not as easy. We can see the more developed countries, they have more people in the urban area. The le less developed countries, more people in rural area. Is that a surprise? Did you know Indonesia was number four? No. Hmm? 260 million people in Indonesia. Okay. Brazil, Pakistan, Nigeria, it's a lot of people, right? Uh, Bangladesh, Russia, Mexico, all emerging economies with a lot of customers. Philippines, 100 million. Vietnam, 94 million. Congo, Turkey, 80 million. Thailand, so. Large populations. Korea is just 27th on the list. Ireland is like at the bottom. 
It's nothing, right? <laughs> Ireland, 4.7 million. Compared to China, 1.3 billion. <laughs> Very small country. So where do you want to sell your product, in China or Ireland? China. Mm -hmm. You're going to sell more in China, yeah. right? It depends if you have some niche product, but yeah, some companies don't worry about Ireland. Even they go to the UK because the UK is a very big market. <coughs> and then Ireland is just like an afterthought. So, well, okay, we're doing very well in the UK, so then let's just go to Ireland, okay? UK has about 60 million. Uh, 60 million. But point is, if we look at the income, right? We see this is clearly there's one country. What's the best country to sell things in? Here, clearly, is the US, right? Because the US has highest incomes and also very high population. Okay, and a similar language and a very developed economic system, okay? And clear distribution system and language. So, US, for any company, US market is a big market. If we can get into the US market, uh, we'll be doing well, okay? And also Canada is also very similar to the US, okay? But these days, the point they're making is that these countries, 75% of the growth is going to be in the large emerging economies. Okay? So they, they're big markets. They are all doing programs of economic reform these days. They're all politically important countries. So, uh, because many of these countries lack modern infrastructure, we can have expected growth in these, indus in these industries. In IT, environmental technology, transportation, energy technology, healthcare technology, and financial services. So these are especially the industries that these countries have some opportunity in. So, what about in South Africa? Where do you think is good opportunities for business? There can be some improvement. Uh, transportation and uh, infrastructure. Transportation and infrastructure is not that good compared to Korea. Yeah. So you mean like highways and trains and that kind of thing? Yeah, subways and buses. Okay. Yeah. Do you think some Korean company could get business in South Africa in infrastructure? Do you know any green companies there already? Uh, well, most of them are there for um, energy. For energy. Uh, the energy industry? Kepco. Kepco. Yeah, Kepco for energy. Okay. Do you know Kepco? <coughs> what about in China? What industries do you think are in China? Is it an opportunity? For improvement in China? Heavy industry. Technology. Yeah, like uh, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft carriers and mm -hmm. jet, like uh, those kind of uh, stuff. Uh, we, we still need to import engines from uh, Russia now or the like, Ukraine. So you um, import the uh, engines? Yeah. Yeah. So there's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. So let's just look at the FTAs. So have you heard the phrase export platform before? Export platform? Do you know what that is? Do you understand platform? <coughs> platform? Uh, this is platform. Platform is like something you can launch off. So Ireland is an export platform in Europe. 
U.S., Ireland, <coughs> right? So Ireland is inside the EU FTA. So companies from the U.S. like Dell, right? Facebook, Google, they come to Ireland, right? Because one reason is Ireland has a low corporation tax, English-speaking population, okay? And then they don't have to pay any tariff, okay? They can set up their headquarters in Ireland. They don't have to pay any tariffs. Do you understand? So Dell manufactures here. But actually Dell moved to Poland when Poland joined the EU. Okay, why? They kept their research and development in Ireland, but the cost of labor in Poland was a lot cheaper. So they set up a factory in Poland. So Poland is an export platform. Dell manufactures all their computers in Poland and exports them over all Europe. Okay? If Dell sell their computers from the US, they have to pay the tariff. Okay? If they make their computers in Poland, they don't have to pay any tariff. That's why it's called the export platform. So some Korean companies also, Kia and Hyundai, in Eastern Europe, they have some factory. So Eastern Europe also has opportunities these days, because low cost of land and labor, okay? And you don't have to pay any tariff, especially Poland. Poland is right like next to Germany, in the center of Europe, okay? Uh, so, other countries here, Bulgaria, Romania just joined, okay? Uh, we have Latvia, uh, Liechtenstein, probably I'm forgetting some countries, but anyway. So it's the same idea for Mexico, right? In, in, uh, the, in the NAFTA. So here we have Mexico, US and Canada. Canada is very big, right? So again, the cost of labor is cheaper in Mexico. So Kia went to Mexico, make a factory in Mexico, sell the cars to the US. Do I need to pay tax? No, where do you want to make a factory? In the US or manufacturing? Where do you want to make R&D, research and development? You need to, for research and development, you're not that worried about the cost of labor. You're worried about the education and best workers. Where are you going to put the R&D? Yes. Maybe the US has a lot of money and research from private industries and universities together. So we might do the R&D in the US and then manufacture in Mexico, okay? And then send the cars to the US. So this is the advantage of the free trade area. So, of course, some U.S. politicians said that, oh, we, because of NAFTA, we lost a lot of jobs, right? The same in Ireland. Some people in the factory complain, oh, we lost our job because of the EU. The job went to Poland, okay? But overall, this kind of free trade policy is positive because the trade between the countries when we have no, less barriers to trade, we can trade more and we can get an advantage okay, from the different countries. <coughs> so the, this is Canada, Mexico and the US. So it's a single market of this many people, a big GDP. So if we, we look at the US, we can also sell in Canada very easily, okay, with no tariffs. Mexico, different language, Spanish. We might have to change, different culture. We might have to change things different, a little bit. Canada and the US, we can look at very similar. Canadians wouldn't like it if they heard me saying that, right? Canadians like to think they're very different from the US. Who was in Canada? Some students was it, were in Canada. Who was in Canada? Do the Canadians like to think they're different from the US? Do you know South Park? South Park? Animation. Yeah. Animation? Yes, that's made by Canadians. They always try to show that Canadians are better than the US. But really, they're very similar. Okay, so uh, all the tariff barriers have been dropped, and it's one of the largest and richest markets in the world. Uh, we have Central American trade agreements, these are Central American countries with the US. We have Meriscore in South America, 
Okay, so it's uh, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, so no tariffs in this area. Okay, so just a note on Latin America. Uh, we can see in the Middle East these days, countries are in the process of moving from dictatorships to democratically elected governments. So there's a lot of problems in the Middle East. But this already happened in Latin America. <coughs> in Korea, you also had a military dictatorship, right, in, uh, in the 70s. So uh, after this, we have privatization, okay? And it's quite a similar culture, just like North America. Most of the Latin American countries have a very similar cult culture. Uh, just Brazil speaks Portuguese, but the rest speak Spanish. Okay, its population is 600 million, twice as big as the US. And they have a lot of resources. Uh, like, you know, the Amazon jungle, they have a lot of oil and wood and natural. Most of the emerging economies have a lot of natural resources. Has anybody ever been to Latin America? Visited Latin America? Where did you visit? Hmm? What do you think about the culture? Is the culture very different or similar in the different countries? Very different. Different? Which countries is different? Uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. What's different? Is it different from Korea or...? No, from each other. Uh, Brazil uh, use big, no Spanish. Mm. Portuguese. Portuguese. Um, they think they are the best in Latin America. Okay, they all think they're the best, right? Yeah. Argentina or Brazil or any of them. Okay, so uh, they want to make a common market in Latin America. It's not, they haven't done that yet. It's complicated. In the Caribbean, we also have a plan to make a common market. Then we have the EU. So, an important point of the EU is they also have the common currency, the euro. So, not all of the countries that are in the EU use the euro. Okay? So, for example, Britain doesn't use the euro. Denmark doesn't use the euro. But there are about 17 countries that use the euro. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, this is a kind of geopolitical problem at the moment. We talked about geopolitics because... The Eastern European states, like Poland, used to be part of the USSR, in Russia's sphere of influence, okay? But Poland has moved to the, the western side, right? A lot of countries have moved to the western side, so Ukraine was one of the last countries next to Russia, right? So Russia doesn't want to use, lose Ukraine. And a lot of people in the Ukraine speak Russian, right? Because some part of the Ukraine used to be part of Russia before. So the Ukraine now has a war because of that kind of reason. Some people in the Ukraine want to join the EU. Some people in the Ukraine want to closer ties with Russia. So, but mainly Eastern Europe has moved towards uh, the EU. Okay? And there are a lot of business opportunities in Eastern Europe. It's a higher risk. As we can see in, in the Ukraine, for example, there's a war, and there can be some political risk, okay? But uh, they're changing from the socialist system to free markets, so there's always an opportunity in that, in that uh, situation. Uh, every country in Eastern Europe is different, okay? Every country has its own problems and is at a different stage in its development. For example, Poland is one of the more developed countries. Uh, so they're privatizing their state-owned enterprises, just like in China, state-owned enterprise like airline or heavy industry, right? Anything, telecommunications, making private. The Czech Republic has done well. Yugoslavia had, was broken up into different countries. Estonia 
Latvia and Lithuania all are doing very well these days. Okay. Estonia has a very, it's a small country, but it has very liberal politics. And because these countries are doing well, then the other countries want to join the EU. In the, around the USSR, we have the Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, is Kazakhstan in this grouping? CIS? Yeah. Yeah? So, it's a loose economic and political alliance with no central uh, border. So they, they have close cooperation about different policies like military and economic policies. So this was formed after the USSR was, was broken up. Can you name some other countries in this? Uzbekistan, 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 Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Central Asia, most of the, most of the Central Asian countries. Yeah. In Africa, Economic Community of West African States, Southern Africa Development Community is the most advanced one, and the East African Community. <laughs> so, these large markets are good opportunities, right? Because we can get the economies of scale. The bigger the market, with no tariff border between the countries, the more economies of scale we can get. We don't have to pay the tariffs. So most multinational groups have programs to foster the economic growth as part of their uh, cooperative efforts. So. We can see all of these groups, the EU or NAFTA or the Southern American groups, their aim is always to improve the economic growth. Okay? That will increase people's purchasing power, improve the infrastructure, and make the economy develop. <coughs> so, we can look at the implication for the marketing mix. So, companies often charge different prices in different European markets, like Colgate, Palmolive, but when we have no tariffs, and especially the same currency, then we can't really charge different prices. It's too obvious. Okay? I'm charging one price in France and another price in Italy. It doesn't make sense. Okay? So, as we have these kind of uh, regions, then we need to charge more or less the same price. Okay? When we have the tariffs, the products from the low price market couldn't move to the high price market because you have to pay the tariffs. Okay, but nowadays, we have a uniform pricing on the products. So let's just a note on China. We have some Chinese students here. So China has actually passed Japan now. The United States has the largest GDP in the world. Okay? Then China is second, and then Japan. So, China has what's called a dual economic system. So it has the capitalism, like the free markets, uh, to a certain extent, but also still has socialist political system, so-called one-party system. Can you explain, Chinese students, can you explain the one-party system to us in China? What is a one-party system? <coughs> Chinese students? What is the one-party system? Do you know? What yes. We don't have communist party. Just the communist party. Yes. And how does it work? Xi <laughs> <laughs> huh? Jinping is not going to watch the video. <laughs> Don't worry. For example, um, in Korea, this is a democratic country. Mm. And the people, everyone, as, you are, as long as you are the citizens in this country, you, can, you have right to vote. Mm. Uh, but in China, the, there are some candidates that are already um, nominated. Mm. So, and uh, if you want to vote, okay. Only we can only choose from the nominated person candidates. That's yes. all. Okay. 
and then they can because what's the advantage of having a one party system? Advantage? Yes. What is it something you want to follow to do? It can uh, improve the working efficiency. <laughs> mm -hmm. People have to follow what they yeah. say. If they have good ideas. They can make one advantage is they can make a long term planning. And as you said, they can make quick and decisive. Yeah. Quick and decisive. For example, in Europe, in the financial crisis, all of the countries have to take a long time, and they don't agree, and then it takes time, and they don't do something 100%. Okay? But in China, they can react quickly and decisive. Do you understand decisive? Decisively, right? And the government has a long-term planning. They call every five-year plan. Five-year plan, five-year plan, okay? Because if I want to get elected in the next election, then I need to think about this four years more, right? Make people feel happy now, then I get elected again. But if I know that my party will still be in power, then I can think more long-term, okay? But so some people think, oh no, the one-party system is terrible. Of course, the problem, what's the disadvantage of a one-party system? Human rights. They don't really care about the potential problems, or they don't. They just don't listen to others' like opinions. Okay. They will just follow their lead. Just kind of a like blindness, right? Not considering people's problems properly, or so on, right? They just they think, oh, what we're doing is right. We're always right. Not listening. Human rights, of course, is a problem. Okay. Uh, because. We have too much power, centralized power, then human rights is going to be a problem. Okay? So that kind of abuse of power and corruption, right? Because there's no checking system. There's no way for them to get punishment properly. Okay? So we can have more we can have bigger problems with corruption. So these days, China's next five-year plan is to stop corruption, right? Try and stop the close down on the corruption. So anyway, in Europe or in the US, most countries, it's not that different from China. They only have two-party system. So you can only choose between two parties, okay? Instead of one party. So uh, in the US, it's definitely a two-party system, right? So you, you just have a choice of Republican Party or Democratic Party. Okay, but at least, you know, they, people can't. If the party is not doing a good job, people can change easily. Okay. But there hasn't been, one of the reasons there ha hasn't been much social problems in China to call for the proper two-party system or three-party system is that the country has been growing, right? Everything has been going well. The economy has been going well, growing at 8 or 7 percent over the last 10 years. So China is doing a relatively good job of combining the capitalism with the one communist political system, okay? one party system. So this combination, they've made an economic boom, and there's a lot of opportunity for FDI, foreign investment. So we can see the high, high growth rates. So in 2000, China joined the WTO, okay? which means China, the US granted the normal trade relations to China. Uh, two steps China must take, improve human rights and improve the legal system. So uh, if we are doing business in China, we have to be a little bit careful about the legal system. It's not as developed as the other countries. Okay? So we, we mentioned about that before when we talked about the legal thing, right? Put a clause in the contract or do the mediation or arbitration, okay? So, uh, there are a lot of opportunities in China. All the loaded components, like you mentioned, engines, right? Construction equipment, education and training services. So, you guys came to Korea for education. Are more, more uh, Chinese people traveling abroad for education and training these days? A lot of them? Yes. 
uh, machine tools, marine industries, healthcare, water, rail equipment, renewable energy, green building. Okay, so all of these areas is an opportunity. So <coughs> the, we have to understand in China they have the national government and the local government. So the national government is in Beijing, but then we have a lot of local governments around the country, right? Beijing tells them to do something, but they don't always listen, especially if they're further away. They have their own local laws, okay? So the law can be quite different in the different places. They might not always follow the central, centrally planned uh, law. Hong Kong was in the British rule. Now it's called a special administrative region in uh, China. We can see that there are demonstrations in Hong Kong about how much autonomy Hong Kong has. Autonomy means, are you able to decide yourself? Yes, then you are autonomous. But they were annoyed, people in Hong Kong were annoyed because the Beijing was trying to uh, say who could be a candidate or who's not going to be a candidate for the election. Okay? But they didn't like that kind of interference they saw as interference, so there were some protests. But uh, it negotiates its own agreements, which are confirmed by the People's Republic of China. Taiwan and China. Uh, Historically, they have some issue, right? Uh, some Taiwanese people want to be independent from China, but Taiwan is still a part of China. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Japan used to be one of the fastest growing countries in the world, but nowadays it's very slow. Uh, growth rate around 1%. Why, the, why, does, why is Japan's economy not going well? They have bad economic policies. Uh, just a general trend we can see, which can cause problems everywhere, is corruption, right? Poor governance. So according to the IMF, Japan used the kind of corruption and pure governance in the 90s. Uh, they kept, they gave the government money to certain they spent a lot of money on saving companies, but the companies shouldn't have been saved. The government saved the companies because they were their friends, right? Or contacts, or family. So they decided to save the company and give a lot, invest a lot of money in the companies. But they were failing companies, and they were just wasting the money. So now Japan has a lot of debt, government debt. Okay. So the government should have allowed the companies to fail, according to the IMF, but the government didn't allow the companies to fail. Uh, so also we have some cultural inhibition. Uh, in the US, they don't like the Japanese system where the promotion is based on the seniority. If you've been at the company for 20 years, you get a promotion. Right? They, they think it's holding Japan back a little bit. Okay? If we just gave people a promotion because they are the best worker rather than the senior worker, then Japan could do a little bit better in the, according to the US. Okay. Uh, Japanese population, older population and shrinking. Okay. So we have their population used to look like this, right? A lot of young people and not many old people. But now their population looks like this. Okay? They have a lot of people in, in the middle, but not many kids here. <coughs> so this can be a problem for the economy. Also, the alphabet system in, in uh, Japan <coughs> is, is hindering the software innovation. So, 
we've talked here the Japanese management culture, lifetime employment, it's very hard to fire people, job promotion based not on merit but on length of service, and also we'll talk about more later, but they are very loyal in Japan to their supplier or their uh, customer, right? So even though their supplier might be doing a bad job and you know not innovating or not improving, they continue to be loyal to their supplier and they don't change. Do you understand loyal? Loyal? How do you say loyal in Korean? So again, that can cause a little, in some advantage, but also disadvantage. So do you have any question then about what we studied so far? So let's take a break then for 10 minutes.